I want to take just a moment and talk about why I'm here, because there can be a lot of confusion or misunderstanding about us discussing this whole issue of Mormonism and and where does Mormonism fit in relationship to the historic Christian church. And uh, you hear the word a lot, cult, and and there's so much connotation behind that word that can be offensive to our Mormon friends and family. It can mean so many different kinds of things, especially in Southern California, where there's been some very strange groups. But I want it to be made clear in the beginning that I profoundly love Mormon people. I've tried to be very careful and very direct about my profound love for the Mormon people. My family are in the Mormon church. Many, many people that I love are in the Mormon church. And so this this isn't an attack on Mormon people, just so I can make that clear. This is discussing if the claims of Mormonism are true. If you know any Mormons, they're some of the most wonderful people you may ever meet in your life. That's the other reason that I'm here, because I love the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that probably most of us here today are a part of. And it's because of these two great loves that I want to address the claims of Mormonism, because they make a direct claim to the Catholic church. So those are some of the reasons why why I'm here. So I'm very grateful to God that he's brought me into the fullness of the faith, overwhelmed by this opportunity to, to speak to you today. of of my great love for him and for his church and to give him glory and that he heard my my desperate cry for truth. I want to give just a quick uh, five minutes or so overview of, in general, what the Mormon church believes just to give you a quick foundation and then we're going to go into that in more detail later. The Mormon church, you can trace probably the beginnings of it with a, a vision that Joseph Smith, who is the founder of Mormonism, said that he had in 1820 in upstate New York, near a town called Palmyra. There, Joseph Smith, after much prayer and reflection, and I'm, of course, speaking from the position of the Mormon church now, uh, retired to a grove of trees, which is now a very holy place for Mormons, called the Sacred Grove. And there he desired to know which of the many churches in the world were true. Joseph Smith had an incredible vision in this grove where God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him and told him in that vision that none of the churches were true, but that he would be used as an instrument to bring the true church back to the earth. Um, In 1823 through 1827, Joseph Smith then had a series of visions with an angel named Moroni. And in these visions, he was told of golden plates that were buried in a particular mountain nearby. He was not allowed to take the golden plates until the fourth year of this series of visions. And then after receiving the plates, Joseph Smith translated those plates into what is now the Book of Mormon. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what the Book of Mormon is exactly. Joseph Smith uh, then founded the Mormon Church in 1830. It was originally called the Church of Christ. It had about three names until it received its final name now, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. After being arrested in 1844, Joseph Smith was in prison and a gun battle ensued, a mob stormed the prison, and Joseph Smith was killed. At his death, the church splintered, and the largest group went west with Brigham Young to what was then Mexico and is now Salt Lake City and reestablished themselves as a people in the west. There were other groups that remained behind following other leaders in the Mormon church. Some followed a prominent apostle in the Mormon church, Sidney Rigdon, And many believe that Joseph Smith's prophetic role was transferred to his sons, uh, including his wife. So Joseph Smith's wife and his children uh, remained. They didn't follow the Mormons west. And Joseph Smith's son became the prophet of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the largest splinter group from Mormonism. Today there are about 43 splinter groups from the Mormon Church, which is only a little over 160 years old. The membership this year passed 10 million, and the Mormon Church has over 60,000 full-time young men and women serving for a year and a half to two years as missionaries throughout the world. Over half of the church now are outside of the United States or do not speak English as their primary language. So that's big transformation in the membership of the church. It grew really modestly until World War II, and from World War II on, the Mormon Church went from eight countries to within 50 years, 
it is now in 167 countries or territories throughout the world. I estimate that about 65 to 75 percent of all converts to Mormonism are Catholic. And that's because where the Mormon church is growing in countries that are traditionally Catholic countries, that is Latin and South America. I had friends that were on missions in South America that baptized two or three thousand people in the two years personally uh, during their time there. That means about uh, 200,000 a year that we lose. And probably over the past 50 years, that figure could be close to two million. So we can no longer ignore the claims of the Mormon Church because they do make a direct claim to the, to the Catholic Church. The Mormon Church, of course, claims that the true church that Jesus established on the earth fell into complete and total apostasy and could only be restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. Of course, we in the Catholic Church believe that the church has remained intact from the time that Jesus established it because he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I will not leave you orphans. I will be with you always. So it does make a direct claim to the position of the Catholic Church. And there are many reasons why I think Catholics are easy converts for Mormon missionaries. And we'll talk about the similarities between Mormonism and Catholicism later. But the other reason is many Catholics are poorly catechized nowadays. They don't know how to explain their faith. They don't know how to defend their faith. And when a Mormon missionary comes to their home, they have close to 100 scriptures memorized. They have very detailed presentations. And that can be very intimidating and very convincing. Uh, Mormons reject the Trinity and reject most of the fundamental doctrines of the historic Christian faith. And so that's why some people call Mormons a cult or a pseudo-Christian cult. Patrick Madrid, who wrote, uh, was the editor of Surprised by the Truth, calls Mormons a non-Christian world religion. And we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but it's just simply because when we say Jesus and a Mormon says Jesus, we're talking about different beings. And that's where it can be very, very confusing for us because we're using different language. And anyone who watches the news of late is getting a lesson in the power of language and the importance of how a word is defined. Um, that's clear to all of us, I think, now, the power of words and their definitions. And so I would assert that we're not saying the same thing, that we're not worshiping the same being. And that was the position of early Mormon apostles. You didn't hear it much in the last 20, 30 years until lately, President, the current president of the Mormon Church, Gordon B. Hinckley, recently said in the LDS Church News, which is one of the official newspapers of the Mormon Church, on June 20th of this year, uh, he made this statement. In bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, President Hinckley spoke, who say Latter-day Saints do not believe in the traditional Christ. He responds, no, I don't. The traditional Christ of whom they speak, meaning Christians, is not the Christ of whom I speak. For the Christ of whom I speak has been revealed in this dispensation of the fullness of times. So out of the mouth of their own prophet today, Mormons would claim and admit that they worship a different Christ than we do. Now that's a significant statement because Paul addressed that issue in the first century of the church in the book of Galatians. And I want to just read an, an excerpt from Galatians to you because it has a direct correlation to this. If you have your Bibles with you, it's in the first chapter of Galatians, beginning in verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. It's an interesting statement that he says, even if an angel from heaven brings a different gospel, because it was angelic visitations that 
was, were part of the formation of the Mormon church. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, that the, our enemy, the devil, appears as an angel of light, and that in the last days there are, there are those that will claim to be apostles of Christ, uh, that are false apostles of Christ. So these words spoken almost 2,000 years ago uh, could be spoken as clearly today. And we need to take that stand, that even if an angel comes and gives another gospel, uh, other than the gospel that was preached by Jesus and through his apostles and throughout the history of the church, let him be accursed if he'd bring any other gospel but that. Let me tell you a little bit about myself now. I'm not a direct descendant of Joseph Smith. Um, there is some confusion about my last name uh, that I may be, but I am a descendant of Mormon pioneers. All four of my generations in my genealogy are traced back to the beginnings of Mormonism. So my ancestors traveled across the plains with Brigham Young. My fourth great-grandfather was Thomas Bullock, who was one of Joseph Smith's scribes, and so he was very close to the prophet. And Thomas Bullock came also to Utah, and became one of the great clerks of Brigham Young. In fact, his signature is on the money that the Mormon church uh, printed at one time. They had kind of set up their own government for some time in Utah because it was outside of the United States. They had the beginnings of their own language, and they had printed their own money, and they had their own commerce. So my fourth great-grandfather, was the, his signature is on that early Mormon currency. I was raised in southeastern Idaho in an all-Mormon community. My teachers were Mormons. All of my neighbors were Mormons. I lived right next to my grandmother, who is a very committed Mormon, and she was the impetus for me continuing to, to stay involved in the Mormon church. My parents were not active Mormons when I was growing up. Uh, my father is a proclaimed atheist, though baptized Mormon. And my mother is what's called a Jack Mormon. That just basically means she's inactive. She doesn't attend uh, Mormon church. Uh, but my grandmother was the, the influence on my life. And so she took us to church as children and uh, continued to encourage us um, throughout our, our life and our formation as Mormons. As a Mormon, um, I had little understanding of what other religions believed. I knew what I had been told about what the Christians believed and what Catholics believed, but I learned later on that most of that was misunderstanding and misrepresentation. Um, for example, I believed, and I believe this as a Protestant as well, that uh, celibacy uh, causes priests to uh, uh, be pedophiles. You know, all these terrible things you hear about the Catholic Church, that the Pope uh, ruled with a heavy hand over Catholics and that every word that he spoke was infallible. He could never say anything that wasn't true. Uh, all of these many misconceptions about the Catholic Church. I had never met a Catholic until I was a Mormon missionary. And that was 19 years old. Uh, and it was on my mission that I had met several Catholics. I had, although, when I was in Salt Lake went inside of the cathedral that's in Salt Lake City, which is just a few blocks from the Mormon temple, right above it. And it's a beautiful cathedral. And I was strangely drawn to that cathedral. Now I can look back and see the Lord tugging at my heart. But then I couldn't explain it. But I would love to just go and sit in that church. Now looking back, I, I can see why. And I've talked to many people from Salt Lake or the surrounding area that know of, of many Mormons that, that sit in that cathedral. I've talked to a woman recently that mentioned uh, a woman she talked to that was continually sits in front of the image of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And she said, I don't know who this woman is, but I feel such peace when I'm here. So the cathedral is a wonderful thing there in, in Salt Lake City. I was very active as a Mormon uh, growing up. At, a, at age 12, I was a deacon. And at age 16, I was a priest. And at age 19, I was, 18, I was an elder. Now, I saw a lot of mouths drop, but this just brings me back to my original statement 
that when you say deacon and a Mormon says deacon and you say priest and a Mormon says priest, uh, you're talking about completely different things. In the Mormon church, a young man is ordained a deacon when he's 12 years old. He's ordained a teacher when he's 14 and he's ordained a priest, which he says a type of consecration prayer over their communion at age 16. And then 18, you're ordained an elder. Uh, and then usually thereafter, you would become a Mormon missionary. So if you meet Mormon missionaries, they have those black tags on their white shirts, and then it'll say Elder Johnson or Elder Smith. There is another office, uh, several offices, really above elder, uh, but the most important would be high priest, which a Mormon bishop would be a high priest in the highest Mormon priesthood. The Mormon priesthood is divided into two, the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the highest, and the Aaronic priesthood, which is what you hold when you're a teenage boy. At age 16, you have the power to baptize, as I mentioned before, and you you say the the prayer over the, the communion that Mormons have. So very active in the Mormon church. I attended Mormon college. They have a the largest private college in the United States, in Idaho, called Ricks College. It has about 8,000 students. And many of you probably heard of Brigham Young University, which has about 30,000 students and is in Utah. I attended Mormon College, and like hundreds of thousands of other young men before me, I was called by the Mormon prophet to be a missionary for the Mormon church. I was called to go to Alabama, of all places. All of my friends were going to these exotic locations in Peru and Italy and all over the world, and I was going to Alabama. But I was very excited about Alabama because I'd always been fascinated with the South because it was known to be the Bible Belt. You know, that's where, that's kind of the center of, of Protestantism in the, in the United States. I was a little nervous, though, because I thought, you know, well, these people know their Bibles really well, so we're going to get a lot of challenges when we're missionaries to the teachings of the Mormon Church. But I actually found just the opposite. People are very illiterate of Scripture, even people that go to church every week. It's not just a phenomenon in Catholicism. It's, it's across the board. People don't know the Word of God very well. In fact, when we would ask people, who in the Bible is your favorite prophet? The most common responses we got were the prophet Genesis and King James. Now, I'm hoping you're all laughing because... Uh, The book of Genesis is a book, you know, it's the book in the Bible. King James is a version of the Bible, and Egypt is a country. So none of them are Bible prophets, but we heard those answers over and over again. So it really testified that people didn't know their their scriptures very well. And there was little resistance to the teachings of the Mormon church. I maybe had, I could count on one hand, people that could throw up valid objections to what we taught. The Mormon missionary lessons that you're taught when you're investigating the Mormon church are very simple. They're couched in Christian language. And the unique teachings of the Mormon church are really not introduced to until after you become a Mormon. The justification we had for that as missionaries is only members of the Mormon church have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if we teach these deeper doctrines to people without the help of the Holy Spirit, they can't understand them. So you don't talk about those things with people. The truth is, from my perspective, if you shared those unique doctrines with people, they probably wouldn't continue lessons with you. You don't, the first time you meet with someone, tell them that you as Mormons believe that you're going to become gods. Or that the god that you pray to was once a man who lived on a planet and progressed towards becoming a god himself and is one of billions of gods in the universe, which is a Mormon teaching, a central Mormon teaching. Because I think in the heart of every man, a little check would occur. Because God has planted in our heart that we know there's something greater than us, and it's not us, and it's something that we will never become. Um, But Mormons did not teach those kind of things to people. After someone is baptized a Mormon, they become part of this very strong social network, That's why I prefer to call Mormonism a culture rather than just a cult because it is a tremendous social network in your life. You're spending three or four times a week in church. Every member of the Mormon church has a calling or a responsibility. So you're either teaching Sunday school or you're helping with some project in the church. So everyone has a responsibility. Every family in the Mormon church 
has two men and two women assigned to that family that visit that family every month, whether that family goes to church or not, just to let them know the church is thinking about them, to find out what needs they may have. There's a lot we can learn from that. So it's much easier to accept those kind of teachings when you're in that type of environment because you look around you and you see all these very intelligent people and it might shock you at first and then you think, well, these people are very reasonable, they're smart people. It's probably just something wrong with me why I have a difficulty with that particular doctrine. And eventually you just learn to accept it over time. When I was on my mission, I can point to probably the first experience that was the beginning of me re-examining the claims of the Mormon Church, or really examining them for the first time. I had never entertained any doubt of the truth of the Mormon Church. I had prayed about the Mormon Church. I had prayed about whether the Book of Mormon was what it claimed to be, another testament of Jesus Christ. And I had a profound feeling that the Book of Mormon was what it claimed to be, that this was God's church, that Joseph Smith was truly a prophet of God. So I, I really never struggled with whether the Mormon church was true until I became a Mormon missionary. And many things started to disturb me. Some of it was manipulation, I felt, on the part of missionaries with people. But one of the first events that I can look back to is when we were in a woman's home and we were beginning to teach her the doctrine uh, that Mormons have about heaven. And for those of you that may not be familiar, Mormonism believes that there are three heavens, not one heaven. There's the first heaven at the lowest level, which is the telestial kingdom. Then there's the second heaven, which is the terrestrial kingdom. And then there's a third heaven, which is the celestial kingdom. People will go to those different heavens depending on their life of good works or how they responded to the Mormon church or if they were members of the Mormon church. For example, if you are a married Mormon, married in a Mormon temple, and you've faithfully lived the Mormon church's teachings your entire life, when you die, you will eventually go to the celestial kingdom, which is the highest kingdom. You and your wife will become gods and goddesses and will have your own planets that you'll populate just like the god of this planet did. If you're unmarried and a faithful Mormon, you will go to the celestial kingdom, but you'll be a servant to those that become gods because marriage is a requirement for godhood. That is why early Mormon leaders taught that Jesus Christ himself was married, and not to just one woman, but to three. Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha, Lazarus's sisters, were all three his wives, and Jesus Christ had children and saw his children before he died. Joseph Smith, at one point in his life, claiming to be a direct blood descendant of Jesus Christ. So that's the celestial kingdom. In the next kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, are those people that have lived uh, good moral lives but rejected Mormonism. So the Holy Father, for example, would be in the second kingdom. He's a good man, but he's not Mormon. The telestial kingdom, which is the lowest kingdom, is where people will go that rejected Mormonism outright uh, when it was shared with them, or people that are murderers, liars, adulterers, thieves, They'll go to that kingdom. Joseph Smith said that kingdom is so glorious that a man would take his life to go there. So in Mormonism, there's not the kind of uh, concept of hell that, that we have in the Christian tradition. There is a place called outer darkness in Mormonism, which is reserved for the devil and his angels and apostates of Mormonism. So those that were Mormons and completely rejected their Mormon faith. So that's where I would be. There's no glory for me. In, in the Mormon faith. When you're teaching that kind of a doctrine to someone, Mormons appeal to a couple places in Scripture, and I'll share those with you now. One of them is in, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 40 through 42. So I'll kind of teach this to you like I was a Mormon missionary. Our Heavenly Father has revealed to us that there's three different kingdoms in heaven, and we usually set out these little pictures on the floor for the different kingdoms. And this can be found clearly in Scripture that there's three different heavens. And so we turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 42, and generally, if the person uh, that we were teaching had a Bible, which was usually the King James in the South, we would just have them read that verse, and then we would interpret the verse for them. 
So this is how the verse reads in King James Version, and it's very close actually in the RSV. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Remember celestial kingdom, terrestrial kingdom? But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from one another, another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So on their table we would lay out three kingdoms. One that looked like the sun, one that looked like the moon, and one that looked like the stars. Sun, moon, and stars, as they differ from one another in glory, as this verse states. It doesn't explicitly mention the telestial kingdom, but it does say sun, moon, and stars, so that's how we would communicate it to people. So we'd say clearly, Scripture teaches that there's going to be different degrees of glory when we die. And then we would teach them about these different kingdoms. We may refer to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In the beginning of that chapter, Paul says he was caught up to the third heaven. Well, if there's third heaven, it's only reasonable to assume that there's two heavens below that if he was caught up to the third heaven where God is. Well, this woman that we were teaching, she had an NIV version of the Bible. So when she read 1 Corinthians 40 through 42, it sounded very different. Now listen to this. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. And the first thing I told her is, you're reading the wrong verse. It's verse 40, and she read it again. Heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. So my next thought was, that's probably one of those evil Protestant translations where they've changed the words, taken things out of the Scripture and put things in the Scripture. And it made it very difficult to teach our point. So I went home that night and got a dictionary and decided to look up celestial and terrestrial to see what those words mean. I never even thought about what those words meant. And guess what they mean? Heavenly and earthly. And then I thought, well, let me go back and read the whole chapter. So I read the entire chapter 15, which is called Reading Something in Context. Well, I read the whole chapter 15, and it was a beautiful chapter about the resurrection. Paul uses this dualism, this teaching method, to say just as animal flesh is different from human flesh, our heavenly bodies will be so different from our earthly bodies. We can't even imagine. It's like a seed in a tree. So it was a beautiful chapter about the resurrection, but it was not teaching three heavens. And that was the first time in my life I think I conceived that possibly the Mormon church was wrong if anything, and just using that verse to prove that point. So then I thought, what about chapter 12? Paul caught up to the third heaven. How do we explain that? And someone had given me a Dake's annotated Bible, which is a Protestant Bible that goes through all different kinds of words and what they mean. But one thing it taught me was, when I looked up that verse about the third heaven, was how Jews understand heaven. And if you go to Genesis chapter 1, it's marked out very clearly for you. When God created the heavens, there's different types of heavens in their understanding. The first heaven God created was the firmament of heaven, which is where the birds fly. It's the sky that we see during the daytime. So to Jews, that was the first heaven. Then God placed stars in the heavens. So at night, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is where God lives, in heaven, beyond those two heavens. So when Paul says he was caught up to the third heaven, a Jew knew exactly what he meant. That he's not in the heavens, meaning he's not in the sky, he's not in the stars, but he's in heaven with God. So that didn't teach three heavens either. And so that was the beginning. That was the seed that was planted. And so I would encourage you when you're talking to Mormons, it's, this isn't a matter of argument or who knows the Bible best or how many verses you have memorized but it's just getting them to think reasonably about their faith. And if you can plant one seed like that, then the Holy Spirit can take that and just do tremendous things with it. Because that's, that's a key point 
for a Mormon to, to even conceive that maybe the Mormon church is wrong, if you can get them to just acknowledge that that's a possibility, you've, you've went eons with them.